Hey, what's going on guys? Ben Brewster here, Trayathletics.com. I'm very excited today to talk about how to improve layback in your pitching delivery. We're going to be going over ways specifically that don't involve stretching into layback. So what are the ways that don't involve torquing on your, on your elbow and on your shoulder uh, to create that enhanced layback for those of you who are uh, missing layback if that is an issue for you guys. Uh, make sure to stick around till the end of the video. We will be giving out a free PDF download with a different throwing routines and corrective exercises that you guys can implement yourselves to work on improving layback, again, if that is an issue in your delivery. All right, so the first thing is gonna be understanding layback. Obviously, we're all familiar with this term, but I just want to uh, kind of go a little bit deeper and make sure that we're on the exact same page as to what layback is and what it isn't. So first off, layback is not the same thing as shoulder external rotation. Now, a lot of coaches, a lot of athletes will use it interchangeably, but the key distinction here here is that layback is the combination of different uh, joint positions that allow the arm to actually go into layback. So when you see uh, the forearm, you know, horizontal at that position of, of max ER, max layback uh, during the throw, layback is really a, a combination of everything that has to go into getting to that position, your T-spine, your scap motion, and not all of that range is actually coming from the true ball and socket rotation at the shoulder. So layback is gonna be a higher number. Maybe that's 180 degrees for a certain athlete, for example. Whereas actual external rotation that's happening in the ball and socket of your shoulder, that's the actual rotation that's happening here, that's never gonna be 180 degrees unless you're, you've got something terribly wrong with your shoulder. That's again, that's just the distinction. When we're talking about layback and we say numbers like 180 degrees or 170 degrees, that is not true shoulder external rotation. So I just wanna make that clear. People use these synonymously. I know we do at times as well, but uh, it's really not the exact same thing uh, for the sake of terminology. So again, layback is the summation of a number of different joints that are contributing to getting that motion at, at the shoulder. But again, shoulder ER is just one component of it. What also has to happen is the thoracic spine has to extend. So our mid and upper back needs to actually be able to extend to contribute to that layback. So from the side, if I put myself in rounded thoracic flexion, and I try to lay back, try to throw from here, you'll see I'm not gonna be able to access very much, if any, uh, layback, because my T-spine actually has to contribute to getting increased layback. So the difference from the side, from thoracic flexion, how much I can lay back, versus thoracic extension. You can see there's a huge contribution, 15, 20, 25 degrees, depending on the athlete, in terms of how much thoracic extension contributes to getting that 180 degree number that we, you know, you frequently hear. Uh, scapular tilt and clavicular rotation are two less talked about contributors to layback as well. In other words, it's not just the T-spine's ability to extend, but it's also the scapula's ability to tilt. It's also the clavicle's uh, requirement or responsibility to be able to pivot and rotate. So as the scap tilts, it basically sets the stage for the shoulder to be able to lay back. So again, using the same, uh, the same example, maybe my T-spine is extended, that's great, but my scapula now is stuck in anterior tilt. Now I go to rotate at the shoulder, that's all I've got, right? Now if I let the scapula posteriorly tilt, there's a lot more range to be had. So it's T-spine, scapular posterior tilt, and shoulder, true shoulder external rotation all combined. And again, the scapula cannot posteriorly tilt unless it works together with the clavicle and the clavicle goes through rotation as well. Again, you don't have to worry too much about this distinction. Just know there's a number of factors that contribute to layback. It's not just shoulder external rotation. I also wanna to touch on the arm spiral concept. This applies to deceleration or layback. Now, when I'm talking about arm spiral, I'm not talking about the spiral staircase analogy that you'll hear. Um, I'm actually talking about this, again, this concept that uh, in order to get into layback, there's a combination of factors. So it's easiest to visualize from the side if we just look at uh, the arm straight extended. So the arm spiral into external rotation would be supination, shoulder external rotation, scapular posterior tilt, thoracic spine extension, and then the arm spiral into deceleration, and this is mostly relevant for a proper decel path, is the opposite. It's pronation. This is what happens after ball release. The arm spiral unwinds the opposite direction. Is pronation, internal rotation of the shoulder, scapular anterior tilt and protraction, and then T-spine flexion and glove side rotation. So when you properly uh, decelerate as well, the arm spiral unwinds in the opposite direction versus winding up in the external rotation uh, sequence of events as you go into layback. So arm spiral happens this way and then it unravels into ball release and then continues to unravel pronation, internal rotation, scapular protraction, T-spine rotation flexion. Um, so just that's the, that's the way that 
we kind of visualize and discuss the, the paired motions that have to happen as a thrower. So again, just an overall uh, overview of what layback is and how we visualize it at Tread. This brings up the next question of, is more layback necessarily better? The answer is that it's gonna be individual specific based on a number of factors. No, more layback is not necessarily better, right? An athlete who's hypermobile and already has 200 degrees of layback, you're not gonna be showing them this video and it's not gonna be relevant for them to try to get more layback. If more layback was always better, then you would see that the hardest throwers in the world were typically those that had the most layback. You would see guys with freakishly crazy amounts of layback. You do see that, but it does cap out at a certain limit. Um, so more is not necessarily better. As we introduce more layback, you potentially introduce more instability into the shoulder if you're getting it from the actual ball and socket joint. Um, so there's a trade-off between mobility and stability. Um, typically, you're gonna be looking at We'll get into this more in the next slide. Somewhere around 180 degrees is roughly optimal. It's what you typically see in the big leagues. It's what you typically see in hard throwers. You'll see roughly plus or minus 15 degrees in either direction. So uh, you might see an example of a Billy Wagner who we can put up on the screen, uh, who has probably more than that, probably close to 200 degrees of layback. And then we'll also see guys, maybe like a Matt Harvey, we'll put him up, um, you know, just off the top of my head, maybe he's around 165, 170, so a little bit less. But there is generally a agreed upon range that you see in big leaguers. And if you're a guy with 120 degrees of layback, that is gonna represent a pretty big limiting factor in your overall potential as a thrower. Um, so again, just important to understand, there's a lot of factors that go into layback. Um, genetic and miscellaneous factors include bone structure. So we all have a certain shape to our scapula. And one of the parts of the scapula is called your acromion or your acromion process that helps form kind of this ball and socket joint. There's this little hook called the acromion. Acromion type is a, a natural variation amongst different throwers. So some athletes have a much more hooked acromion and they're more predisposed to getting impingement type symptoms or limited layback as they go into layback. Basically type one, type two, type three acromion. Again, don't worry about that too much. Just know that different bone structures can contribute to more or less layback that you're physically gonna be capable of getting. Humeral retroversion. So this may contribute somewhere between five and 10 degrees. Uh, the literature is a little bit varied on how much it really contributes. But the bottom line is that during, uh, during bone development, when you're a kid, when you're playing Little League, uh, and you have a history of throwing from a young age before puberty and before those, those growth plates are closed, the humerus actually goes through what's called retroversion. There's actually a torquing of the bone uh, to accommodate increased layback. Point here is that you can't necessarily control what you did if you played a bunch you know, of Little League, if you threw a bunch as a kid, but when we see athletes who come to us and they wanna pick up baseball at 16 years old or 20 years old, like we do see cases like this, typically those are athletes who are going to consistently struggle to get adequate external rotation at the shoulder unless they happen to be of naturally looser guy because again there is a certain uh, amount of retroversion that occurs at a young age and so some athletes can kind of if they don't play baseball at a young age or don't throw footballs or whatever they miss this window of opportunity potentially for 10 degrees give or take of layback to occur congenital slash ligamentous laxity you know we talk about you see athletes who are double jointed or whether or not they're athletes you might know somebody who's double jointed well what does that mean well congenital laxity basically means they have more room in their joints typically you're not going to see an athlete who just has laxity in one joint it does occur but it tends to be more of a genetic factor you'll see athletes who can you know bend their finger back and touch their forearm or when they do an elbow extension test they have a huge amount of gross hyperextension or a big valgus carrying angle when you look at their arm and extension from the front or they have a ton of room in their shoulder and their arm just flops around because they have so much room or their knees hyperextend when they stand so this is called congenital laxity. There's basically more room within the ligaments, within the capsule, within the joints. So they're gonna have more capacity to get layback. That's never really gonna be an issue for those types of athletes. So if you're watching this video, you probably don't fall in that category. Just one thing I wanna point out is that hypermobility or congenital laxity is a double-edged sword. It's always a trade-off between mobility and stability. If you have a very, very stiff shoulder, very limited layback, very limited range of motion at your shoulder, well, you have more stability, but you have limited mobility. There needs to ideally be a combination of both uh, for optimal performance and optimal health. So again, that's what we're shooting for. That's what we're trying to figure out is the optimal balance depending on the athlete. So again, we already touched on the degree of layback. Roughly 180 degrees is what you see at the big league level. Again, plus or minus 15 degrees. There's not necessarily one magical number um, because everyone has different mechanics, different anthropometry, different uh, different variables that they're playing with within their own body structure. There is such a thing as too much layback, um, but it's relatively rare. I'll put a couple videos up here on the screen of athletes that I've trained and or played with who, if anything, I did feel like had too much layback. Now, I say that because they ended up having issues where 
they had a lot of velocity fluctuations. Uh, there was a lot of tendency because of all this added range of motion for them to kind of drag their arm into ball release. And so for those athletes, it really helped them to stay downhill and really take advantage of downhill action um, versus kind of dragging their arm through release just because they could. So again, it's relatively rare. I could count on two hands the number of athletes that I've come across who I would say definitely had too much range. I mean, just flipping balls, you know, 200 plus degrees of, of layback, a ton of that coming from their shoulder. But again, pretty rare. You're probably not gonna be in that category if you're watching this video. I'm also gonna put up some examples of limited uh, layback versus excessive layback versus uh, somewhere in this ideal range. Again, most of the MLB pitchers that you're gonna see, uh, see on TV are gonna be somewhere in that ideal range. It's very difficult to throw 95 plus if you have extremely limited layback. If you have 120 degrees of layback, you're probably not gonna be throwing 95 and no one's gonna know who you are. You're not gonna be pitching on TV. And again, if you have excessive layback, again, that can be an issue as well. It can be very difficult to maximize velocity if your arm is basically just this limp noodle because you have too much range of motion. Final note, stretching is into layback is generally, or into shoulder external rotation, I should say, is generally ill-advised by most of the therapy world. Again, we're not therapists, and I'm not saying this is a black and white issue uh, that you should never stretch into layback. Again, we must respect the stability slash mobility demands of the shoulder. The shoulders are already an inherently unstable joint. It's the most mobile joint in our, bo our body. It's a ball and socket joint. We inherently have a ton of motion, a ton of degrees of freedom in the shoulder to be able to move it into flexion, extension, layback. There's a ton of uh, mobility there, but what comes with that is less stability. It's much less stable than something like a knee joint because of that. So we have to respect that we're already dealing with an unstable joint and that stretching into external rotation for a lot of athletes, um, it can introduce excess instability into the joint. So the point of this video is to understand, okay, what other components can contribute to layback without necessarily destabilizing the shoulder joint itself. So just a quick note, guys, if you find this video helpful, interesting, uh, entertaining, uh, go ahead and like the video. It helps the video out tremendously in the YouTube algorithm and shows this video to more people like you so we can get our message out there. And again, if you find this interesting or entertaining, hit the subscribe button so you get notified uh, anytime we release future content. Uh, finally, if you're not familiar with who we are as a company, we do online coaching for athletes. We coach hundreds of athletes around the country, handling their programming from a throwing standpoint, lifting standpoint, mobility standpoint, and assessing and evaluating their throwing biomechanics. All right, so the next thing is injury considerations. Uh, this is something that I came to understand and realize over the course of the past five or six years, having uh, seen various scenarios occur as you try to improve an athlete's uh, mechanics and layback. Injuries are something we need to be aware of. A sudden or gradual loss of prior lay layback may be indicative of a protective mechanism. In other words, if you're an athlete who has always had a ton of layback in your shoulder your entire career, and then suddenly something happens and now you've lost 30 degrees of layback, uh, well, it's not as though your body genetically doesn't have that range of motion. Something has happened to create that decrease in range of motion. Again, it could be something simple like a mobility issue. We'll talk about that in a second. But a lot of times it can be a protective mechanism from an injury. It can be a shoulder injury where the body realizes, hey, it hurts going into true layback. I'm gonna shorten up, I'm gonna tense up, and I'm gonna limit that amount of layback. Or it could be an elbow injury where the body is trying to basically avoid the maximum torque position or the maximal uh, stretch position. So we just need to be aware of that. This is especially true if the loss of layback occurs, again, post shoulder or elbow injury. So maybe you, know, you frequently see an athlete who has a, a flexor strain or they come back from Tommy John and they come back a little bit too quickly and their body starts to put the brakes on and put these protective mechanisms in place um, where it limits their ability to, to get layback and starts compensating around whatever potential issue they have. So again, it's the arm trying to avoid delicate end range and or peak torques in a lot of cases. Um, so again, we just need to be aware and be able to identify if that's what's happening before we just try to open up a ton of range and again, expose the underlying injury. So as far as uh, return to throwing programs and how this relates, um, we need to be aware don't force through compensations. So if you're coming back from a shoulder surgery or shoulder injury and you notice that your mechanics have changed, you notice that you're, you're pushing or your arm is dragging or it's not giving you the layback that you used to have, um, rather than rushing through that rehab and just saying, screw it, I'm gonna throw this way now, uh, you might need to kind of pump the brakes a little bit on the return to throwing. Take a step back in the rehab until that body actually, until your body gives you and accepts that new range of motion or that original full range of motion that you have. So again, I can't emphasize this enough that if you're coming back from an injury, don't just accept that your mechanics have changed for the worse. A lot of times it's because guys are being rushed back onto the mound by their trainer, by their coach, and their body's not ready for it. A pseudo throwing phase, uh, this is something that we incorporate into our return to throwing programs, is it's not just hey, do a bunch of band work, and then once you're out of pain or once you hit a certain uh, week or month uh, post-injury, just start throwing. Um, we don't like to do that. We like to gradually build guys up into throwing to make sure that their body's ready for it. 
So a pseudo throwing phase would be basically a medicine ball, a phase of medicine ball work, where it's things that are kind of like throwing, they're pseudo throwing, but they're not actually throwing, so they're not actually taking you into full layback. But things like medicine ball, trampoline, rebounders, internal rotation tosses, uh, things like medicine ball wall taps, things like medicine ball push passes, um, a number of different exercises that are exposing your elbow, your shoulder, whatever you injured to that valgus stress and to that torque, but at a much lower level and not getting into as extreme of positions. If you pass through that and progress through that type of phase, now we begin on ramping through a throwing phase. And again, we will use that for almost every injury that we see to the elbow and shoulder in the return phase. The only difference is it's not gonna be a 12 or 16 week or a six month rehab as you might see from a surgery. It might be a two week return if it's just a minor strain, um, but you're still gonna go through a planned progression. You're still gonna hit various checkpoints before you come back and begin throwing an actual baseball. The other thing is, again, be careful trying to increase layback in these scenarios. If you think any of this might be going on, you really need to be on the same page with your physical therapist, your trainer, uh, your coach, to make sure that as we open up range of motion, you're not predisposing yourself to, uh, to injury if a protective mechanism is what's going on. Okay, so how do we actually improve layback then? So uh, we've established it's not necessarily a compensation around an injury. Uh, how do we improve layback or what factors contribute to increased layback? Uh, well, the first uh, question mark is, well, more throwing. Does throwing it's in and of itself actually increase layback? And there is some evidence that it does. Uh, so shoulder extra rotation uh, increases several degrees over the course or a couple degrees, depending on the study you read, uh, over the course of a season. So in this particular study, they followed professional pitchers over the course of a season, measured their shoulder range of motion in uh, external rotation and internal rotation, and they saw an average about one and a half degrees of a gain in external rotation over the course of a season. So just throwing continuously over time, there is an adaptation towards a little bit more external rotation at the shoulder itself. Again, we're talking about true shoulder external rotation, and there tends to be a loss chronically over time of internal rotation. And this is the GERD concept, the glenohumeral internal rotation deficit. Most pitchers have more layback, more external rotation rather, on their throwing shoulder than they do on their non-dominant shoulder, and a little bit less internal on that shoulder because again, not only the bones are shifted, uh, but the body starts to adapt to a more external rotation uh, dominant balance in the joint. So potentially you're looking at one or two degrees of gain over the course of a season. Uh, another study looked at the effect of a weighted ball training program over six weeks on shoulder external rotation. Now this particular study reported an average of 3.3 degrees gain in shoulder external rotation. Uh, this study was highly criticized within the industry. So I would encourage you to read the study for yourself and kind of take it for uh, for what it's worth and, and see if you agree with the methods that they used in this particular study's protocol. Uh, but again, it can be safe to assume that there is some sort of increase in external rotation from throwing, whether it's over the course of an entire season or it's from a weighted ball training program, there is likely some at least minor increase in external rotation from throwing. Now this tells us that we probably should have some sort of planned deloads at some point in the course of a year versus just throwing and throwing and throwing and throwing all 12 months of the year. It can make sense to have some sort of deload at some point uh, as the shoulder just continues to gain external rotation over time. There is a high degree of variability within external rotation testing between actual uh, testers. How one, uh, one therapist or trainer or researcher defines max layback may be different from another. Uh, so that's just something to be aware of as well. And again, this is not our recommended way to increase layback. This is gonna happen kind of on its own anyway, just as you go through the course of a season, as you throw, there is potentially going to be an increase in layback, a very small one that happens no matter what. Um, but again, we're not recommending that you just go rip a bunch of pull downs every day of the week just to increase layback in this way. This is just something to be aware of that there is uh, an adaptation that occurs over the season. So tissue and mobility work, this is a big one. This is a good way to indirectly address layback and external rotation um, without having to actually torque your way and, and stretch into external rotation. Which tissues or structures are involved in being able to get into layback? Again, we talked about this, this arm spiral concept or the summation of different joints to get into layback. So the thoracic spine has to be able to extend. Well, a lot of athletes already have great T-spine extension, but a lot of them don't. What's called a kyphotic posture, basically your typical uh, nine to five you know, desk posture. If you're really stuck in thoracic flexion, this kyphotic posture, again, that can typically limit your ability to get into extension. Now, again, not every pitcher is going to need to work on that. Some, if you assess them, will have plenty of extension and they're actually overextended, some of them. So this, again, takes into account, you really need to do a thorough assessment or have yourself assessed by someone who knows what they're doing to see if that's an issue or if it's not. We talk about the pec a lot, pec major and pec minor. Uh, again, these can basically drag the humerus. The pec major can actually drag the humerus 
into internal rotation. And if that gets really, really tight, you see, you know, frat guys walking around, guys who bench press a ton, they walk around in humeral internal rotation. They have kind of that gorilla posture. Um, so that can actually limit your ability to get into layback if your pec major is super, super tight. The pec minor can limit your scapula's ability to posteriorly tilt because the pec minor does attach on the scapula and it does drag it into anterior tilt and can limit your ability to get into posterior, posterior tilt when you throw as well. So basically we need to address pec major, pec minor, the tissue quality of everything on the front side of your shoulder to make sure that that's not limiting you in layback. Uh, subclavius and coracobrachialis, you don't need to worry about that too much. Just know there are a couple other muscles as well that can limit you. We talked about the clavicle needing to be able to pivot. Well, the subclavius can be a contributor to that not happening. We talk about, uh, again, coracobrachialis can be a limiter in layback as well. Uh, more so in scap loading, but again, we have found that can be a, uh, a common tissue that's gritty, dense, and limiting uh, for layback as well. And then a posterior shoulder block. So interestingly enough, some athletes will be limited in layback, and what they'll say is, it's, oh, it's not really a tightness feeling on the front side. They feel like there's kind of a balled up knot on the back of their shoulder that they're running into when they go into layback. And so sometimes that can be a really gritty, dense posterior cuff and you address the tissue quality there and they're able to get much cleaner layback and the, the ball and socket joint is able to pivot better. So these are the tissues that we will often address with mobility work and specifically soft tissue work. But a common misconception about tissue work is that it's just about opening up range. Well, that's really a secondary benefit potentially to tissue work, but tissue work isn't directly about opening up range. That's a benefit if excess tissue tone was limiting the range. So if you're walking around because you have so much just to tone in your pecs and you address the tissue quality and now you find that, hey, I'm in a much more kind of neutral position. Well, that's a secondary benefit, but really what you're doing when you do tissue work is you're improving the pliability and the hydration of the actual fascia and the soft tissue. And this improves its ability to lengthen, which is called extensibility, and the ability to contract. If you have super balled up, gritty, nasty pecs, like maybe you're able to bench press a lot, but it's actually going to contribute to your ability to, to be healthy and for that muscle to fire if you address fascial adhesions, you address the actual quality of the tissue. It's not gonna hurt your ability to, to bench press more weight. It's just gonna allow it to have the extensibility as well and help those fibers actually translate and contract better. So this is something that I didn't know five or six years ago that I've come to, to appreciate even more about tissue work because it's not opening range. That just happens if you happen to be limited by a tone issue. So outside of actual tissue work, uh, we also use a lot of active mobility work to, uh, to work on improving, uh, in this case, range of motion. So while tissue work is not really directly working on range of motion, active stretching is. And the real distinction is between passive stretching and active stretching is, again, kind of imagine just sinking into a hamstring stretch and just kind of holding it falling in passively or statically um, versus going into a kind of like a PNF hamstring stretch where you get into your end range, then you actively push back, then you relax a little bit more, then you actively push. The difference is that active stretching is about gaining strength and turning on those muscles at these end ranges. So what we're really trying to do is gain control of that joint at that specific new joint angle. So if we're talking again about a horizontal abduction scap retraction. So maybe we're doing a pec stretch. It's not just about passively hanging out in a door like this. It's about getting into that range and contracting the muscle fibers and teaching it to be able to contract in that lengthened position. So we'll use a lot of contract relax techniques, uh, FRC, which is called functional range conditioning. They have a whole system and certification process uh, that really goes through a lot of these concepts. Pales and rails, you might recognize that terminology. Uh, extreme isos, again, just static holds in lengthened positions. These are all concepts uh, that relate to active stretching, but again, it's about strength through length. Strength in some of these more delicate positions that you'll see in, in a throwing delivery, uh, or even in like some, somebody like a sprinter. Um, preventing hamstring strains isn't just about statically stretching and gaining more range of motion, but it is about gaining strength in that length and position. So something like a weighted RDL is gonna be more beneficial towards preventing a hamstring strain because you're loading the, the fibers, you're loading the tissue, uh, at that range instead of just hanging out statically. So hopefully that makes sense. We use a ton of active stretching protocols. So now I wanna talk about some mechanical variables that can contribute to limited layback. Uh, these get a little bit more uh, complex and individual specific. So again, if you're not sure if you fall under some of these categories, I would encourage you to get assessed by someone who's familiar with pitching biomechanics and see if maybe you have one or more of these mechanical issues. But the first one is fixing arm timing issues. Now specifically, I'm talking about a late arm flip up or a late arm at landing. Now what that looks like in practice is as they go through their arm path, their arm swing, when that front foot hits, the arm has not actually gotten into a vertical position or into any amount of external rotation. Um, the arm tends to be either horizontal 
or even further down, sometimes you'll see kind of inverted W. But the commonality is the arm is not up at landing. And so when the arm is not up at landing, what tends to happen, if I face the camera this way, is the arm starts to flip up as the shoulders rotate. And so as you begin to open up the shoulders, open up the shoulders, now the arm starts to flip up, flip up, flip up, flip up, flip up, flip up. And maybe now the forearm is vertical, but by this point the shoulders have already fully open, the torso is open, my chest is facing the target, and oh crap, I'm only one frame away from ball release. And so now you only have an instant to get layback before you have to release the ball. So you're actually not giving yourself time to create or demonstrate layback because the arm is not on time. And so you only get a hair of layback, and then you have to let go of the ball because you're already fully open. The difference there is if the arm is up at landing, now as you turn, the arm is able to be driven into and relax backwards into layback, and you're able to deliver the arm and apply force to the ball over a much greater arc of motion just because the arm is up and on time and has the ability to drive into layback, spiral out and around into a good ball release. So I can't stress that enough. That's a very common issue. Um, we just did a breakdown of TJ Antone, actually, where if you go watch that breakdown, I'll put a card up here so that you guys can click on that, watch it next. But again, he just had a, a little bit of a late, uh, a late arm, a little bit of a timing issue. And by improving that, his arm was able to demonstrate significantly more layback and he saw a velocity bump the next year. Again, that's an extremely important uh, mechanical variable to consider. The arm runs out of room to demonstrate full layback when it's not flipped up at landing. Now, fixing arm plane issues. What do I mean by arm plane? We're basically talking about if you draw, if you put a line through the shoulders, or you, maybe you can visualize it with like a PVC pipe held on your back, as you rotate, there's a certain plane associated with, the, with that, that line through the shoulders, this plane right here, that varies as your torso moves in space. What you want ideally is as you rotate, the elbow and the humerus is in that plane. Now, that seems rather obvious to have the elbow in plane, but what, what happens is if the elbow is a little bit low at landing and you go to rotate, the arm drags down here because it's not synced up in plane. The elbow is not in line with the shoulders. Or sometimes you'll see that elbow climbs well above the line of the shoulders, somebody like a Joel Zamaya, um, and it's not in plane with the shoulders, it doesn't have time, and it doesn't actually sync up into that rotational plane. So the torso is rotating in a certain plane, we want the arm to get on board that flight. We want the arm to be able to sink into that same plane. And at that point, it's gonna maximally be able to demonstrate layback again. So arm, the arm dragging, the elbow being low, or the elbow being high is not going to maximally allow layback to occur. So the other component would be a linear follow-through. And there's a number of different causes that can contribute to a linear follow-through. Um, but again, it comes back to, as opposed to rotating the torso in, in plane or perpendicular to the spinal angle. I've written articles about that, so we'll link that below if you're curious and want to learn more. Uh, linear follow-through is basically forward flexing and finishing with kind of this forward crunching action. This is something I struggled with personally in high school where I didn't understand. It's about rotating around the spine, and it becomes much more of a linear follow-through where you're trying to forward crunch towards the target. When you do that, again, you're not sinking that arm up in the rotational plane, and you're not going to demonstrate nearly the same degree of layback. Um, so again, that is a very common cause as well. I put early torso rotation down here. When you land and you're already open with the torso, you tend to see that paired with a linear follow through because you're not in a closed blocked position to actually rotate around your front side. So again, that's just another cause, arm plane issues for why you might not be demonstrating ideal layback in your delivery. So the next mechanical variable that can affect your ability to demonstrate layback is throwing posture. Now what I mean by throwing posture is where is your torso and pelvis relative to your center of mass? So are you tipped a little bit forward? Are you tipped way backwards? This is your posture, this is what I'm talking about. So the loss of a pelvic torso head stack, as we call it, is a common reason that you will see decreased layback. And what that typically looks like is for a righty, I'm a lefty so I'm gonna demonstrate it obviously my way, but the weight shifts towards third base, so their weight would tip forward they're, they're, they have an anterior weight shift towards the toes. Um, we, again, call this tipping forward to our athletes, but it becomes a much more quad and toe-driven move towards the plate versus a heel and uh, glute dominant drive towards the plate. So when that posture starts to tip forward, what you'll typically see is at landing, they're in a little bit more of a forward anterior tipped posture and they lose the ability for that thoracic spine to actually demonstrate extension. So they get kind of stuck in this position at landing where they can't really rotate from, they can't get the same type of uh, T-spine extension to actually get into good layback versus when you keep their weight a little bit more posteriorly shifted, a little bit more towards the heel, a little bit more upright or stacked, then when they get into layback, they have a lot more room to actually maneuver and rotate, rotate through their T-spine. And be, again, we know that the T-spine 
the ability of the T-spine to extend clears the way for the scapula to tilt and the shoulder to actually uh, go into layback to deliver the arm. So just by maintaining and addressing posture, a lot of times that will improve shoulder layback as well. We just tweeted a video of one of our coaches, uh, Paul, who had a transformation from mid 90s to upper 90s. Uh, huge difference just by addressing uh, posture along with some different changes to his training protocol that really, if you show side by side, uh, which we'll put up here on the video, you can really see the difference in his ability to lay back and extend just by that shift in posture. Now let's finally talk about what fake layback is because if you're an athlete who struggled with layback, uh, you probably, you've probably tried everything, you're probably videoing uh, yourself, looking at it from the side or the front and trying to see if what you're doing is working. Now something that we've come across in working with different athletes is this concept of fake layback that we, uh, that we termed several years ago. So basically from the side, what fake layback is, if you look at me, if I throw from the side and I climb the elbow, there will be an instant in the video where that form is gonna be way beyond horizontal and to the untrained eye, that will look as though I'm getting a ton of layback. Um, but what's actually happening is you gotta be careful watching side video because it's not actual layback. The elbow is basically climbing up and it becomes a tricep driven push. And so from the side, it looks that instant like there's a ton of layback. But if I bring the elbow back in plane where it should be, you can see that it's not actually that degree of layback. This is how much true layback is occurring, but by climbing the elbow, it appears to be you know, 45 degrees more layback than it's actually, actually occurring. So the way that you tell if it's true layback or fake layback and it's just the elbow climbing is from the side, you wanna look at the position of the elbow relative to the ear. So when they get to that position of maximum layback and you're looking at it from a side view, where is that elbow relative to the ear? You want that elbow to be back behind the ear or at least back behind the nose when they hit maximal external rotation or maximal layback. And if the elbow is up here at max layback, that's a sign that they're just shooting the elbow forward. From the back or from the front, if you wanna really confirm this, you're gonna look at the position of the elbow relative to the line of the shoulders. So if this is my shoulder angle at ball release, you ideally, or at max layback, you ideally want the elbow in line with the shoulders as we talked about. What you'll typically see is that elbow's up here. If they're, if they're shooting the elbow forward and it becomes a push, that elbow is gonna be way up above the line of the shoulders. So again, this is the line of my shoulders. You want that elbow in plane, not up above. So those are the two ways to identify if it's true layback or if it's fake layback. If this is something that you're working on, videoing yourself and trying to assess if it's actually working. Guys, thanks so much for watching this video. I hope you found it helpful. If you aren't already subscribed to the channel, go ahead and hit the subscribe button and make sure to like the video. We've put together a free one page PDF for you guys with a little bit of a routine that you guys can try, some mobility ex exercises, some correctives, and a couple of throwing drills that I might recommend uh, to guys that are limited in their ability to get laid back. So go ahead, check the description for details on how to get that PDF. And then again, if you guys have any questions, drop a comment down below. I respond to all the comments on this channel or shoot us an email to contact at See you in the next video.